In this third video on Marxist critiques of capitalism, I want to talk a little bit about oppression. Liberals tend to view the system of free labor that characterizes capitalism as uh, one that's superior to the feudal system that preceded it, where workers were legally tied to the land or leech lord. Um, but Marxists tend to respond that although uh, these kinds of freedom are, are maybe a, a small improvement over a feudal system, uh, just because you're able to choose your employer uh, doesn't mean that you are remotely free. Now, one reason uh, for this analysis uh, is that uh, workers in a capitalist system uh, are now newly dependent on earning wages for subsistence. And you have to look at this in historical context from where Marx is talking. Uh, when Marx is writing, uh, still an overwhelming majority of people live on the land, but more and more of them are starting to live on the cities. Uh, now, when you live off the land, that is to say when you um, grow your own food, uh, you in some ways always have at least some modicum of control over your own survival. Because even if uh, the crop is bad, you can still usually eat your crop. Um, now, that didn't stop famines from occurring, of course, but uh, it suggested a degree of control over your own survival that once workers reach the industrial cities, they tended to no longer have. Uh, you get to the city, suddenly you have to work for someone or you are going to starve. And if there's no jobs or nobody wants to employ you, uh, then uh, you are essentially in a system where you will do almost anything uh, and take almost any job in order to, to survive. And this, this condition Marx sees as particularly unfree. Um, so as long as one can, there, were, there was an option to, to go to the land and farm for subsistence, you can maybe speak of a decision to take a job in a capitalist economy as a voluntary one. But once you reach uh, the situation that Marx was seeing in the industrial cities, uh, taking going back to the land was no longer an option. Uh, part of this has to do with enclosure movements. Uh, that's a part of history we don't have time to to go into. Part of it has to do with, with simple demographics and population explosion. Uh, so somewhere between the changes in land tenure system uh, and uh, demographic changes, uh, it just was no longer an option. Just like it's not really an option for us today to go live off the land. Um, I mean, it's not a realistic one anyway. Um, so for that reason, uh, taking a job for Marx in a capitalist system uh, is not really a voluntary act because the alternative is uh, starving. Now, it gets a little bit worse because if there's large numbers of unemployed workers waiting, waiting to take your job, then your bargaining position inside the firm um, or even outside is going to be very weak. Uh, this means that to some extent, one's submission to the orders of one's boss inside the factory or inside the workplace uh, isn't really voluntary. Uh, because the choice is work or starve, and uh, since uh, no one can realistically choose starvation, then uh, it's not clear how this is a voluntary choice. Um, the law, in other words, under a system of free labor, may not compel workers to work for any particular capitalist, but the system certainly does compel you to work for someone. Uh, and that means that capitalism unavoidably forces people into relations of subservience. Uh, why? Because factory relations uh, between employers and employees uh, are hierarchical. Uh, the boss gives the orders and you do them. And if you don't do them, you get fired. In fact, under early, early industrial capitalism, if you don't do them, you might get beaten. So this leads us, all this situation um, leads Marx to distinguish between bourgeois freedom and real emancipation. Bourgeois freedom, uh, bourgeois freedoms are not worth having. Uh, in part because they tend to undermine real freedom. What are bourgeois freedom? Well, bourgeois freedom are uh, the freedom to choose an employer, or the freedom to start a business, or the freedom to advocate for capitalist ideas even. All of these freedoms tend to undermine the real emancipation of the worker. Uh, they give you a kind of freedom, but in some ways they undermine your ability to gain true freedom. Because true freedom requires something more. For Marx, real emancipation is associated with what Berlin would later call positive liberty, the freedom to be in control of one's life. And whether it's in the workplace or in the marketplace, uh, the worker is just not in control. Uh, the boss is in control, uh, the market as a whole, the conditions within the market uh, condition one's options, 
Uh, so it's not possible for Marx to say that under that circumstance, under those capitalist circumstances, anyone can be truly free. In fact, even the capitalists aren't free. The capitalists themselves operate in harsh competitive climate uh, to which they are subservient. Uh, it's not true that the boss can really is really free to set his own prices uh, because if the prices are too high, the competitors will come in and, and undercut him. So uh, the market has this way of, of disciplining everybody. Not It's not just the worker in that sense. Uh, so in that sense, in, under capitalism, no one's really in control of their own lives. Uh, in order to be, be in control of your own life, Marx thinks, you have to institute communism, where uh, the workers gain control over the capital that employs them, that enslaves them, which is a little hyperbolic, but not, not so much from the Marxist point of view. So how, how do we respond to these charges, uh, these charges of oppression under capitalism? Um, for one, I think one type of response uh, centers on trying to ask yourself uh, which kinds of dependence and independent, which kinds of dependence are morally problematic. Uh, I think it's true that today workers for food, for instance, are dependent on complex global supply chains. Uh, in other words, other people uh, need to do their jobs uh, to bring the food to the supermarket, to the restaurant, or to the deli. Um, you have no control over that. And so if they don't want to do it, then you are likely to go hungry. Uh, at the same time, it's not clear that these global supply chains are unreliable. In fact, I think it's pretty clear that there are many fewer famines today than in Marx's day. People go less hungry and are better fed uh, in a world with probably something like 10 times more people in it, uh, you know, over 7 billion today, uh, there's more people and they're better fed. Uh, and part of the reason for that is because of capitalist farming, uh, farming for profit, but also the establishment of global supply chains of trade where if a crop fails in one part of the world, uh, it's very easy to ship um, and buy food from another part of the world. And so if weather is bad in Asia, that's okay. If, if, if there's a drought in Africa, it's not good, but the people won't starve because there's this opportunity to import food uh, from elsewhere. So I think what we have to think about is um, when we're thinking about relations of dependence and independence, we need to think about which kinds are truly morally objectionable uh, and which kinds are uh, in some sense um, still compatible with, with being free and being making choices uh, and to some extent being master of one's own destiny, although of course no one is ever fully master of their own destiny. Uh, so uh, I'm going to pose this to you. Which kind of, let me, let me offer you a few examples of dependence and, and you tell me which ones you think are, are morally objectionable. Marx thinks that depending on one's employer for a paycheck is particularly problematic. Uh, but of course, the employer depends on his or her customers for an income. Without customers, uh, the employer makes the business makes no profit. Uh, many people, uh, whether because they don't have the right skills or because they have a psychological problem or because uh, they are handicapped in some way, uh, uh, depend on the government for welfare checks for their subsistence. Um, many people depend on their own families for assistance and for childcare and on their parents and their brothers and sisters and their cousins and their spouses and their children. Uh, and children, of course, are ultimate, the ultimate dependents. Uh, people also sometimes depend on, on churches for extra food and clothes and other voluntary associations. And of course, we all depend on our friends for a variety of things, including a couch to crash on between jobs or between houses. Um, these are all forms of human dependence. Uh, so the question then becomes, how do we sort out the objectionable dependences from the unobjectionable ones. No one makes it alone, right? So uh, to show that we are dependent on the employer is not to show that something evil has occurred because we can think of all kinds of dependents that we think are more or less okay. Um, again, uh, one might take the, the, and I think the position, uh, the uncompromising position that no one should be dependent on anyone for anything is just not sustainable because at some level uh, it looks like each of us is dependent. So um, we have to reformulate the critique or, or Marx has to be more specific about, about what's particularly objectionable. Yes, the employer can um, exercise power over me in the workplace and tell me what to do. Uh, the question then becomes, why is that a particularly oppressive or objectionable? Um, 
Now, Marx thinks it's objectionable because uh, we don't have any other options. But I think, I think, or that the worker just doesn't have any other options but to work for a capitalist. Maybe not that particular capitalist, but a capitalist. Um, but I think we can all think of workers who just aren't particularly oppressed. Indeed, we can think of cases where the workers, uh, in some ways, uh, end up oppressing the owners. Um, we'll set those things aside for now. But uh, I think we have to be a little bit more sensitive to the very uh, the varieties of situations that occur in the marketplace. Yeah, uh, it's certainly the case that, that in some cases, uh, workers don't have any good options. Uh, if your only skill set is mining, for example, and the mine closes, uh, you may not have very many good options. Uh, but uh, there's other cases where uh, I can think of, for instance, today, uh, nursing and accounting are, are the two professions where there's essentially no unemployment. In fact, there's a huge demand for these uh, these kinds of skill sets. And the only unemployed nurses and unemployed accountants are ones with serious problems on the record. And even they sometimes get hired because, again, the skill set is in demand. So um, those workers, because they have options, just don't seem to be able to be oppressed by their uh, employers because if they are mistreated, they will leave and someone else will be very happy to uh, employ them. So uh, you know, issues of freedom and security in the market are going to be variable. Where There are going to be other jobs, of course, that uh, mirror more closely the situation that Marx saw under industrial capitalism where, where the workers were essentially unskilled and easily replaceable. And under those circumstances, I think it's easy to imagine the kinds of oppression that Marx has in mind. And so um, the question then becomes, um, in order to, to rescue workers from the intolerable kinds of unfreedom that they may experience in the working place and in the marketplace, uh, do we have to abolish the market? Or can we think of some way of helping uh, those people specifically without undermining some of the benefits uh, that accrue from living in a market society. Um, so I think in general there's going to be two responses available to defenders of capitalism. One of them I just gave you, right? One of them is endorse the creation of a welfare and a regulatory state that tries to solve some of these problems without destroying the market. Uh, the other option is more radical. Um, and that is to just deny that these problems are morally significant, deny that the kind of freedom that Marx is after is the kind of freedom we ought to care about too, too much. Let me talk about each of these in turn. Uh, so you can solve some of these problems of oppression within the workplace without destroying the market by doing things like establishing a welfare state, particularly unemployment benefits, disability benefits, things like that. In other words, this can keep workers free because it means that when you refuse a job offer, you're not going to starve, right? Remember, work, uh, Marx's critique depends on the idea that uh, capitalism offers you the choice work or starve. And that's true without a welfare state. Uh, in some circumstances, that's the case. But if you are free to say no to the employer, uh, that doesn't just increase your bargaining power when you're looking for a job, but even when, you're, when you have a job and your employer asks you to do something uh, that you're not comfortable with, having a uh, Another option, which is to to receive some portion of your uh, your wages uh, as a form in the form of an unemployment check, uh, is an important check on the worker on the employer's power within the workplace. Uh, furthermore, in addition to providing uh, unemployment insurance, uh, in, in addition to providing uh, disability insurance, uh, regulating the power of employers within the workplace is still going to be consistent with the free market. Because I think if you say something like, if the government says, if you employ someone, you must not treat them in X, Y, Z ways, that's not quite the same thing as telling them what to do with their property. The worker is not their property, after all. Um, so uh, Im imposing conditions on, well, imposing regulations on working conditions uh, doesn't, it certainly inter interferes with the freedom of the employer to do whatever the heck they want, but uh, in some ways it doesn't interfere with uh, competition, um, and it doesn't really interfere with private property either to the extent that, the, again, the workers themselves are not, are not property. Um, so you don't have to destroy the market to make workers free. Uh, that's one response. Uh, another response uh, that you might be tempted to take is that uh, scarcity is not an invention of the market. The market doesn't make uh, scarcity. In fact, the market, if anything, makes things more abundant uh, by, by, 
producing things more efficiently uh, makes more things available than were ever available before. Uh, scarcity is a fact of human life. Uh, human beings have nearly unlimited wants and desires, but face problems of limited resources. Uh, so it's true, you might respond to Marx, that sometimes one's options in the market are unappealing. One, the, the choice set that we face is not very good. Uh, but you might respond that having a bad set of options is not the same as being unfree. Uh, the bad thing about feudalism is you had no options. You literally had to work for a particular employer. Um, in a market society, maybe you have to work for um, someone you don't like, uh, but you at least have the opportunity to choose, and that opportunity to choose is intrinsically valuable. Um, these defenders can further say, each person is responsible for their own survival and their well-being. It's not the employer's responsibility to see that you don't starve, and it's certainly and maybe nobody else's um, job to look out for you but yourself.